to go. I have five points on my list. Yesterday I also had five points and I managed to go through three. So today I'll try to really manage to go through uh, five points. And I'd like to start with briefly discussing this paper, which was published earlier this year in the journal Multilingual. Um, by the way, for those of you who are interested in um, easy, accessible, easy readable stories about the language industry, I recommend this journal. Uh, it is not, some papers are and this also is, is not absolutely precise, and not very scientific. I read it in a train usually. So, um, and for students you can get a subscription one year for free. So please take advantage of this. The journal is called Multilingual and uh, I think they give a good overview of the translation business, the language industry, uh, some technical issues, very easily accessible. And I'm not an owner of this journal, so I'm advertising this without having any stakes uh, in this. Now, this paper was a bit thought-provoking because it claimed that you could actually measure the benefits of using statistical machine translation numerically. And uh, the argument goes a little bit like this. And it nicely fits in with what uh, Nancy talked about this morning. Whenever you have a client who wants uh, translation, you might consider machine translation. The question is, how much do you gain by using machine translation? And they say there are three things that you need to take into consideration. First, how closely related are the languages involved? Second, how much training material do you have? And third, for the language pairing question, and third, um, how similar is the text that needs to be translated with the training material in terms of the domain? They call it domain similarity. And the first interesting thing is they have numerical values for language similarity. And I would like to discuss this with you. So here on the right hand side are language closeness relative to English. And they say the closest language to English is French with the value of 0.8 followed by Spanish with 0.775. Portuguese the same, then it goes down to Italian, Dutch, Swedish, Danish, German is 6. Arabic, the same. Uh, then Korean, Finnish. And down below comes Czech and also Slovak. There's no Slovene there and I think there's no uh, Croatian. What do you think? Question. How do they cut this? I mean, because, okay, French and English, Lexis, we know it's 70% more or less and so on, but do the historical reasons. Here, like, Russian? The interesting thing is, there is no explanation in this paper how they came up with this number. <laughs> <laughs> it's really out of blue air, yeah? out of their feeling, they said, out of the experience, we know. And that what makes the paper very esoteric to say. <laughs> um, but at least it gives like food for thought, and you can think about where your language would fit in. And of course, this is all closeness to English. If you want to build a system that translates between French and Slovene, you have to make your own list of similarity. Um, it is not explained in the paper how to come up with these numbers. So this is number one, and then number two is, and I think that makes perfect sense, the size of the training corpus, training set, size factor, TSSF. Um, and they say if you have twice the amount, then it influences the quality of machine translation. And finally, 
uh, all three things can be shown into this magic triangle, training set size, language closeness, domain similarity, and they have the magic formula, where is it? Uh, here, oh no, that's only the training set size, and they have the magic formula to calculate uh, how much time you save when, depending on numerical values. What I want you to learn from this is, yes, these three things matter. I absolutely agree, these three things are important. Language closeness, domain similarity, training size. I would like to warn you against using this formula. I think in most cases it will not work. Other opinions on this? Um, and, and when you say after a while, that means after 100 million words or after 200 million words? Or? Billion. Oh, for all languages. Okay, but that doesn't count. I mean, we need to look at. Oh, that's that's important also. Whenever somebody gives you a number on the number of words in a parallel corpus, say I have five languages and uh, I have 500 million tokens in there. Uh, that doesn't really tell you much. Always ask for the number of tokens for a pair of languages. Uh, so, because otherwise, we were always looking at pairs here. So, a billion words per language parallel. Okay. So that's a lot. Uh, we said that the Europal has 50 million and so now we're talking about a thousand million, uh, one billion words per language. And then you're saying now even from 500 million to a thousand million, you don't get any improvement in the... I don't know, but I remember that we were just 500 million words per language, and then we were talking about this group. Maybe for one thing, or... I think it's something we had now. Then the technology comes in and then Neural can maybe do it better than SAP and so on. Okay, uh, I think for most people here in the room, they don't have a million or a bill they don't have a billion words at their fingertips, so uh, that's a very special case for the European Union. So for most other domains, the numbers will be much smaller. Could you maybe give us the title of the article yes. or in which multilingua could we find? It was the first issue 2017, and the title was um, Measuring, what was it? This is the title page here. Measuring the Benefits of Using SMT by Andrei Chutron and Chun Liu. Chun Liu is a professor in Dublin. I know him. I don't know this person, and I don't know it. which country is he from. Tell me from the name. He's in English. He's British. He's British? <laughs> Very clear to from the name. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Please, if you want to look at this paper, please do, but take it with a grain of salt. This is not um, hard scientific uh, evidence. Okay. Number one, uh, hooked off. Second, I uh, want to show you something about um, visualization of uh, word alignment. So you remember yesterday 
we talked about automatic word alignment. So what we want to do is we have sentence alignment. So we know that Euro Bargeld, keine Blütezeit für Blüten, in German corresponds to Euro Cash, no golden days for forgers. So we have word aligned um, documents. Now we are computing, we have sentence aligned documents. Now we are computing the word alignment. And what a system does, it produces something like this. So it says, in the first sentence pair, word number zero is aligned to word number zero. Word number zero is also aligned to word number one. And uh, only computer scientists can enjoy a representation like this. Nobody else in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's why we programmed a little script in order to show us um, what that really means for the sentences in question and here is the output of this. So here we see, and this is a typical way of displaying the result of word alignment. So we say, you see the German sentence here on the vertical and the English sentence here on the horizontal and each black square is a square where the word aligner has actually said these two things are aligned. So Euro Bargeld is aligned to Euro Cash and Keine is aligned to uh, No and uh, Zeit is aligned to Golden Days, uh, Für is aligned to Four and Blüten to Forges. And uh, now we can actually inspect what the uh, word aligner has done. And I leave this here for a second because this is really nicely aligned. Uh, it's also not very complicated because words are in the same order and the sentence is short. And if we look uh, further down, then we see <laughs> weird alignments. Yeah? We see, for example, here that the word coins is aligned to a lot of things here. Uh, Euro Bargeld is actually aligned to Euro coins and notes. That's pretty nice. Um, so, this is a really nice way of inspecting word alignments. And what we can see is as long as the words are more or less in the same order, word alignment is relatively easy, obviously. Um, but as soon as the order is, is different, word alignment makes quite some errors as well. Uh, I should note, I should mention that this corpus that we used here was experimental, only about 1.5 million words in English and German, so it explains a little bit uh, why we see these uh, arrows here. Um, still, uh, what we need to do, accept is that word alignment makes errors, and the interesting thing is that the statistical machine translation still works because it uses the alignments that are the most frequently done and those are most of the time the correct ones. Um, so I find this, this very fascinating to basically look a bit inside the uh, types of alignment that it does. Sometimes it's surprisingly correct, sometimes it's surprisingly wrong. You also see that if certain things are missing on one side and are only represented on the other side, then it's much more complicated rather than if everything is there. Uh, for example, you see Symbole für Offenheit und Austausch, and in English it's a totally different uh, headline. Uh, can forges take advantages of this? And then, of course, the uh, word alignment says cannot do anything useful there. But um, it oftentimes, if there is a compound in German, it really finds the corresponding two words in English, so central bank, central bank. Uh, here, what do we have? Sicherheitsmerkmale, security features on is also still in there, and there's an erroneous one still here. So, this is the kind of result that we're getting from automatic word Just to give you an impression of how good or how how good it works on the one side and how limited it is on the other side. Okay. Everybody with me? Okay.
looked at number two, so we have a good chance of going through the five points today. Now I want to have a look with you at the output that um, the Let's MT system creates. And one thing that it does is it produces a so-called training chart. This is very difficult to read. Let's increase this a bit more. Now, I want to, whenever you train a system with Let's MT, the system internally produces such a training chart to indicate to you which processes it has gone through, which steps it has gone through in processing your input. So let's look at a few things here. Um, we are starting with our parallel corpus. And the first thing that it does is called NER Pro. What does this mean? Anybody knows what the abbreviation NER stands for? Name and entity recognition. Exactly. So we're dealing in the first step, we're dealing with named entities. So we are trying to identify where is a person name, where is a topographical name in the text that I have to translate. Why is this the first step? Well, obviously you want to protect these names so that they're not translated. So if you have the word, uh, if you have the name Bill Gates in there, Bill Gates is one of the worst names ever for machine translation. Because <laughs> both Bill and Gates is ambiguous with regular words in English. Yeah? So you should, uh, we should actually introduce a strategy that all person names need to be distinct from regular nouns in, in the language in order to avoid this ambiguity. So, um, and in English it's not that problematic uh, because uh, if the word is spelled in uppercase then it's a name so it's rather easy to recognize. Which language is the worst for this? German. Because all nouns are spelled with uppercase uh, letters, start with uppercase letters, and so there is an unbelievable mess of an unbelievable mess, an unbelievable mass of um, ambiguities. So first thing is we do name entity recognition in order to protect names, and then we do some pre-processing, and then we do tokenization. Uh, what is tokenization? Also something everybody needs to know that important in every natural language processing application. Dropping the text into its... Uh, so everything, <coughs> that it, everything that is not the space. Right. So everybody gets the idea. So when we have a running text, then the punctuation symbols are glued to the words, and we want to have the words separate. And then we need to split off the punctuation symbols from the words. So that's the tokenization step, and it's not as easy as one can think because of apostrophes, because of slashes, because of hyphens, and all kinds of things where it's debatable whether to split there or not. And then the processing goes on, and here comes the next interesting point here. Uh, Let's MT tells us that it has been doing true casing. What does that mean? See here, it's true casing or lower casing. In this step here, it has done true casing rather than lower casing. So, upper case and lower case, so it has to do with large uh, letters rather than small letters. So one easy way of dealing with uh, the text is to turn all the text into lower case letters. Uh, in the beginning of the sentence, we have an uppercase whatever letter D or A or whatever, turn it into lowercase. Anything goes into lowercase. Why are we doing this? Because we want to treat the word the 
with an uppercase in exactly the same way as the word the with the lowercase p. Okay. So that is one way of doing it. That would be called lowercase, turning everything into small characters. Now, if we do this, then names will actually be, or everything else that is in uppercase letters in the middle of the sentence will also be lowercase and we will lose some distinction. In German, for example, the word arm means the arm means the, the part of the body, whereas in lowercase it means poor. So we have to really make a distinction. And if we turn everything in lowercase, we lose this distinction. So the thing that Let's MT here does is say true casing. That means to do lowercase only on the first letter of the sentence and leave everything else within the sentence untouched. This is called true casing. Then starts the training process here. And we have a step consolidate. I have no idea what this is. And then comes um, alignment. So this is word alignment now. This takes a lot of time. Word alignment is the most computationally intensive step in all statistical machine translation. Alignment. Word alignment goes usually in one direction. So if we have a, if we're training a system from English to Slovenian, then we first align from English to Slovenian. And then we need to align from Slovenian to English. And then we need to symmetrize this. So this is the step symmetrize here. Based on the word alignment, we do the alignment of word sequences. So once we know that there are certain words aligned, then we can say adjacent words are also aligned. This is the phrase alignment, extract phrases probably around here. And then we are building this bilingual dictionary that I talked about. That's the phrase table, does it show somewhere here? Build the table, <coughs> consolidate the table in halves, I don't know what that is. <clears throat> and in the end, we have the translation model built in this step here. So this is the most time-consuming step. On the side here, the system goes through building the LM, goes through building the language model. Language model is only built monolingually on the target language side. Again, we're doing the same things here. Why do we do uh, named entity recognition and tokenization here separately? Well, because the corpus that we're using for the language model might be different from the corpus that we're using for the translation model. So the parallel corpus is used here, and the monolingual corpus is used here. They can, the monolingual can be a part of the parallel, but it can also be totally separate. I haven't said anything about the tuning, and I'm not going to explain this here. Uh, maybe just to have a rough idea, uh, once we have the translation model and the language model, we want to um, optimally set the probabilities that we have computed in the translation model, and that is done in the tuning, but I haven't explain that here and I think it's it's getting too far. In the end, we can use the system that we have produced for translation and let's say T does an evaluation step. But what does that mean? We said that we can automatically compute scores for the translation quality based on an evaluation set. 
So if we have 1 million tokens to start with, we're taking a little bit out, which is not used in building the system, and we're using that afterwards to automatically translate and to compare the output of the machine translation system on these sentences with a human translation. And that's what is being done here. And then uh, Let's MT can compute uh, scores to tell you how good is your system. Okay. And then based on all this, Let's MT gives you an insight again on what it has done on the so-called training report. And now you see here that the system I have built uh, took 4 seconds for fetching, 34 seconds on filtering, um, 10 minutes on configuring, and 1 hour and 42 minutes on training. So the training, that's the building of the bilingual correspondences of the word alignment that is the most intensive part. And then in the end, it's a little bit of saving. Evaluation is not even mentioned here because that goes like a flash of lightning. Um, and you can monitor all the steps here on how much time it took and so on. And the interesting thing is, uh, one thing is a filtering. Uh, let's filter report of parallel data. Where do we have it? Here. Uh, the initial segments that have been used for, that I have picked in my parallel corpus were 59,000 segments, parallel segments, parallel sentences, if you like. And the system has uh, removed 494. Hey, come on, why is the system throwing away 500 of my sentences? This is me. Um, what is the reason behind this filtering step? Well. Filtering means uh, taking out sentences that are long, typically longer than 30 words. So if a segment on either side, either on the input side or on the target side, has more than 30 tokens, it is taking out from the training. Then we're not using it. Why is that? What do you think? Why do we throw away long sentences? It would be a one-use sentence. It was made for one use only. It would be usable to other sentences. Yeah, but within that sentence we might have fragments that are also used somewhere else. So, no, that is not a good uh, reason. It's too long. It's too long? Uh, what does it mean? I mean, for the computing. For the computing time and for the computing quality of word alignments, what does it mean? What do you think? I, I have the same idea. They are need to complicate it to otherwise that it's too long. Right. That's basically the right insight. As the longer the sentence is, the more complicated it is to find the corresponding words across the languages. Mm -hmm. huh? You remember? Word alignment means, on the basis of statistics, compute for each word in the English sentence, which word in the Slovenian sentence does it correspond to. And if the sentence has like 50 words on either side, it has a lot of options to consider. And we don't want to do all this, so we say we only consider sentences that are smaller. And this number for this sentence length number, you can set yourself. So, in general, it is set to 30. Um, so, if your training corpus is relatively small, what do you do? Do you set it higher or do you set it lower? Uh, higher, because? Because the computer has um, less find the right. Exactly. So then you're setting it higher, which means you're throwing away less material. Whereas if your training corpus comes from the European Union and you have one billion, you're setting it to maybe 15 or 20 words 
and you throw away everything else because you have enough training material, take only the ones that are easy to compute, telling us exactly the correspondences. So these are the kinds of considerations that you can uh, do when you are building your machine translation system. And in the end, <clears throat> of this training report, in the end you're getting the um, Lewis course, where do we have them? Okay. Um, in the end, you're getting all kinds of numbers telling you how good your system is based on the automatic evaluation that has been done. And uh, it is actually uh, interesting to look at um, for single words. Um, it's easy to translate very well. For, for two grams, word sequences of two, it gets uh, lower, lower, lower. And so you can see um, which sentence length basically leads to what kind of uh, score. And <clears throat> I should maybe, I thought there was an overall score, but I cannot find it here at the moment. There are too many numbers. Uh, the blue score is the one that we are looking at the most. Um, I want to introduce the blue score the end of this lecture, so maybe we'll leave this out for, for the time being and come back to this later. Okay. Um, again, the message here is there is a lot of information that Let's MT gives you about what it does in the background, and you can monitor a little bit um, what it has done for a particular corpus. The more you know about the inner workings, the more information you're actually getting out of this. Um, this is, I would say, partially interesting for translators. It's very interesting for computational analysts. Just wanted to make sure that if you ever look into these two things here, you have a basic understanding of what you see. Understanding, let's empty. You've got some ideas. True casing, you know, filtering, you know. So these are considerations that we do. Now I'd like to talk for a few minutes. Oh, now we should actually have our stretching break, right? Yeah. And let some air in. So five minutes break to have some fresh air. Das 
Keine Verbesserung mehr da ist. Okay. okay. Aber da bin ich interessiert an dieser Zahl, weil natürlich den Studenten erkläre ich immer, the more data is better data. And uh, if there is a break-off point, that's interesting to know. <coughs> I can imagine that there, there is kind of a saturation point and uh, you cannot really see an improvement anymore. Right, I mean that's... Exactly, exactly. And then the more you use, the more reliable it gets. That, that is very, very easy. And that's how how homogeneous is that material um, in the I, I didn't get with and, and to what degree is that made available? So does Google have all this? It's okay. It's public data. Okay. So like companies like DeepL or Google or so they have this as part of their own uh, system because I mean it's probably one of the largest uh, parallel repositories worldwide I would say. The language combinations because you have 20 language or 24 times 24. <coughs> Today with uh, building parallel corpora. Um, this slide is dear to me, and I would like to really recommend it to you because if you're looking for public, large public parallel corpora, uh, I think these are the most important ones that people are using for building machine translation systems, and. 
They cover many of them cover your languages as well. Um, they are most of them are available from the collection that Jörg Tiedemann maintains at the University of Helsinki. We we've looked at this yesterday. Opus also from the Glory. So uh, whenever you start searching for parallel corpus, this is a good starting point. From all of this, these corpora. I think open subtitles is the most problematic one in two respects. Uh, first, in, with respect to the quality, because a lot of these subtitles that are in open subtitles are, I don't want to say stolen, but uh, looking for a better word, uh, somehow ocr from videos, so people have used programs to scrape them from commercial videos, so that means they, they are extracted and they contain a lot of OCR errors. Um, plus the fact that second issue is that copyright issues are at least debatable, if not outright wrong. I mean, people have stolen these subtitles, many of these subtitles, from commercial productions. So, um, just be careful with open subtitles. I think everything else is, is fine, as far as I can see. Um, <clears throat> everybody knows the TED Talks? Yeah. Okay, so somebody would like an explanation on the TED Talks? Okay. Okay. Um, one thing that is also important to me is to say Paracopera is seems like a new trend. We are now collecting them for the last 20 years, but in fact, I mean, they have been around for <laughs> at least uh, 2,000 years uh, in order to reset us from. Um, I want to advertise a little bit of what we have been doing at the University of Zurich. We have built a corpus on the yearbooks of the Swiss Alpine Club and the British Alpine Club from 1864 until today. So we are building parallel corpora that stretch over long time periods. And you can, of course, debate how useful that is for machine translation. Um, if you have texts that span 50 years or more, or 100 years, but uh, we do this first for machine translation and second also for linguistic studies. And then, of course, for linguistic studies, this is wonderful material if you have mountaineering reports spanning 150 years, all kinds of adventures being described in German and French and Italian, uh, and the students really love to work with this. So this is a wonderful uh, text source. Um, second, we have built a corpus on the Credit Suisse Bulletin, that's the oldest banking magazine of the world, as they claim. Uh, starting from 1895 and uh, starting in German and French and then later on it was uh, also published in Italian and in English. For 10 years it was also published in Spanish but then disappeared again. Here we probably have around 10 million words in German and French and in the Swiss Alpine Club um, there is about 20 million words in German and French, but only a bit less than half of that is really translated. The other ones are articles that are in German or in French only. And we have also built a corpus on uh, medication, so we are not the only ones. Uh, other people have done this as well, so this is also interesting uh, material. Now, in order, to, um, in order to exploit uh, these corpora and, and to search them, we have built our own parallel corpus search tool, which is called Multilinguist for a multilingual word information system. And uh, this is my first example here of how multilinguists can actually help you to detect translation errors. Here we're looking at the European, at the Europol, European Parliament debates, and I have searched here for the English word July. Increase this a little bit, 
And you see here on the right hand side that in German it has been translated with Juli 914 times and 15 times it has been translated with Juni, June. So obviously something is wrong here. So we have uh, about 15 cases of mistranslations and we can uh, search them. We can see, show, tell us the system, only show us these cases and then we see here the United States withdrew these measures unilaterally on the 15th of July, 1996, in German. Uh, it was a month earlier. Can you see the author? Um, <laughs> we can see it was from the session 1997, 13th of May, when this was actually uttered. Uh, but we, we don't see the translator yet. No. We don't know the translator. Um, <laughs> Next example, uh, dated the 24th of July, um, again in Germany it's the 24th of June, and you can see on the other languages it's also uh, July here, I'm not sure about the <laughs> Finnish part here, um, and so on and so forth. So such a search system can show translation errors based on statistical word alignment. That's important to me here, because we didn't tell the system what kind of correspondences are possible on the other side. We only compute statistically the word alignments. And it tells us that in this sentence here, in this English sentence, the word July, the most likely candidate in the German side is the word Juni. And based on that, we can sort the hits and we find that in about 1% of the cases, July and June are actually getting confused. And uh, now we can say, okay, we're doing the same thing here for, um, for the German word Juli. Searching this. And then we see in English it has seven translation variants. Amongst them, uh, the word June about 18 times. So it's not only from English to German, but also from German to English that you're finding these translation errors. You can also go from French to English. Between June and July, there's about 1% of translation errors between all the languages that we've looked at. And interestingly enough, that also carries over to other corpora. So in our Swiss uh, mountaineering corpus, um, between German and French, it's also in about 1% of the cases there's a confusion between June and July. So whenever you translate the text, I don't know if in your language the words June and July are also so close to each other, be careful. It's easy to confuse them. What else can you do with this tool? You can uh, look for certain expressions. I like to look for Clip und klar, which is an idiomatic expression in German. And you can get uh, translation examples uh, rated by, ranked by the uh, frequency. So a bit similar to what I showed you yesterday uh, with our bilingual language system, but now we are having multiple languages here in the background and we allow you to browse through the examples, so I think this is a nice help tool also for translators in order to see translation examples for certain expressions uh, that you have translated before, other people have translated before. This system, Multilinguist, you can use uh, on our <coughs> website, if you like, um, with uh, the Europa corpus, but you can also get it and install it on your server at your university if you like. So, and then you can pump in your own parallel corpus, if it's only two languages or three or four or five, it doesn't matter. Um, we have built this in a way that it should not take more than maybe a day for a technician to set it up on your server and then you can enter your own parallel corpora and search your own parallel corpora in this. So if you're interested in using multilinguists, it's free of charge. 
you'll be happy to distribute it to whoever wants to use it. Um, it's um, yeah, we would like to see more users for this. Anything else that you're interested? Um, one thing that linguists always want is to say uh, we are only interested in a certain expression if it was originally uttered in English. So we are only interested in the expression, um, first of all, if, the, if that was actually in the original utterance, not in the translation. And you can say this here, and say we're only interested in uh, cases where, first of all, um, has been uttered by an, an English speaker in the European Parliament, as far as we have the information. And now we're only seeing cases where, first of all, um, is, is there. And then if we want to study cases where this has been translated from German, then we can select German here, and so on. And so for translation studies, probably interesting. People enthusiastic about this, want to use this? <laughs> okay. Send me an email if you're interested in this. Uh, this is similar to Lingui, obviously. Many of you know Lingui. Um, what I find interesting with Lingui is that uh, when I used that in 2014, it had these little pie charts to indicate that storm is a much more frequent translation for storm rather than te te um, tempest. Uh, but now they have somehow abandoned this. It's no longer available in the current version. Um, so now we only get a list of these uh, expressions and um, you don't know which is more frequent than the other. Uh, the other thing that is interesting with Lingui is that obviously everything um, has been collected automatically, which means sometimes you end up seeing in Lingui machine translated output. And here you see a nice example where you're looking at the word, at the German expression sang und klanglos, which in English probably con corresponds to something like with fur without further ado. Yeah? And here we see an example where this German sentence uh, was actually machine translated into English because otherwise you would never have something like sang and tonelessly, which is a, a more or less literal translation of sang and klanglos. And so they should have filtered this out uh, they should have noticed, they should have automatically determined that this is a machine translated text, shouldn't show it here, but these are the kinds of errors that also are in the um, What can we do with Parallel Corpora today? I also already showed you one example, which I would call um, translation error detection. Another uh, example is you can use Parallel Corpora today for finding new translation variants. And here's my favorite example. Um, if I look for the word uh, Fragen in a parallel corpus of subtitles, one million subtitles, German English, and I search for this in our word aligned system, the German word Fragen means um, mostly ask. In, uh, in English, and then we're getting ask with 800 hits and say with 250, wonder with 145, question with 46, so this is all fine. Now, we all knew that these are translation options, you probably even find them in an electronic dictionary, but now comes the interesting one. Number five is go, and my first impression was Go, that must be an alignment mistake. How can the word Fragen be, have a correspondence with go in English? And then we look at the example. It does actually, in English, I would say. Yeah, and this is the example. Yeah. Yeah? Und sie fragte, and she goes, what's that? 
Huh? I was young, I went, where's England? So that was probably yeah, the was thing really that we were thinking of. Huh? And so it's, it's um, maybe a bit uh, youth jargon or colloquial English, but it's um, rather unusual, but uh, nowadays I think more and more used expression that you can use for <coughs> saying, that you can use for asking, and uh, so statistical word alignment helps you to detect cases like this in the data. Wonderful. <laughs> I need smiling faces here. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so we already looked at the translation error detection. Uh, the other thing that um, I like about using a system like Multilinguist is you can use it for finding synonyms. So um, let's maybe go back to clip und klar again. You might notice that we included a language detection here. So I enter clip and klar and it realizes that this is German. And if I want uh, synonyms in German, if I want explanations in German what this really means, I can basically use the other language for mirroring. So I can go from the German expression and get the English list here, click on one of the English uh, translations and then go back to German and then I get synonyms in German for clip and class. So, for example, if I go on clearly here, then I see um, that expressions like eindeutig, deutlich, are um, synonyms to the first word that I entered there. So, going from one language to the other and back to the same language gives you synonyms for this, the thing that you started out with. Pretty easy take some basic language understanding. You shouldn't do this without understanding anything about the language because sometimes you have incorrect alignments there. Uh, but then it really helps you to get to, to broaden your vocabulary based on parallel corpus. <coughs> I have mentioned a few times did I say this in class or only over beer last night? That we have uh, worked with a Quechua, building a system for a Spanish Quechua. So we built a small corpus, parallel corpus on Spanish Quechua, based on some <coughs> text that we found. There is a, a biography of a Peruvian, which is actually original uh, published in Quechua with a Spanish translation. We used that, we used the Bible and the Declaration of Human Rights from the <coughs> United Nations and that's what's feeding in here. And the thing that I want to point at here is that for languages with a lot of morphology, um, it might actually be advantageous to do lemmatization and to do word alignment not on the word forms, but on the base forms of the words. And that's what we did here for Spanish Quechua, because Quechua is a language with a lot of inflection. And you see the word sunku, which means heart, corazón, um, has different forms here. So yunkuipi, so yunkuk, so yunkuk, and so yunkuk. And we still want to align all these and so we are only doing the alignment on the stem of the word rather than on the different word forms because then it gets much more complicated. <coughs> okay, I'm skipping over this here. Maybe a view at the future um, of Parallel corpus searches. I like to believe that the future will also uh, allow us to search parsed corpora where we have uh, syntactic information. So here is our experimental system. We have again Europol parsed with dependency relations where we say human rights relation that human is a modifier to rights and then 
right. human rights um, is uh, the subject of this uh, sentence here and so on. And then of course we can have uh, queries that say we are only interested in two words if they have um, a certain syntactic relation to each other. Um, so this is maybe more interesting for linguists rather than translators, but uh, that means here we have the uh, syntactic relations on the English side, so we have the word alignments here between English and Spanish, and then we can search through um, all this information and then find cases also where the words actually are far apart in the sentence uh, but they have a syntactic relation uh, computed by the parser and based on that we can make decisions. I don't know if that's relevant to anybody's work here but I find it a fascinating view inside the structure of sentences. Okay, uh, Oliver? So, uh, the example that you're showing is that an existing query tool? That's an existing query tool um, that we have built, and uh, it's really in the background is uh, Europal, the complete uh, version for, I think, five, six languages, uh, out of which we have parsed, I think, three or four. Um, and if you're interested, let me know. And easily get access to that. I'd like to close number four here, parallel copper search tool, unless there are questions to this. It's a little bit of an excursion because it doesn't isn't directly related to machine translation. But it's a byproduct of what you get by doing automatic word alignment. Uh, what can you do on this parallel corpora once you have the word aligned? And that's what I wanted to indicate with some of these suggestions. Okay, last 15 minutes, um, we would like to look at number five here, which is um, the blue score. I already mentioned that the Bleu score is a means to automatically compute the quality of a machine translation. Basically, it is a um, similarity metric telling us how similar one text is in relation to a number of other texts. So, let's assume we have the translation here in the middle, then we are checking for other similar texts. In that respect, there are four human reference translations. How many words in a machine translation occur in any of these four texts? How many word pairs? occur as word pairs in any of the references and then we go to word triples and word quadruples typically. And what I find counterintuitive in the beginning is that we are actually not only comparing this with one text at a time but we are comparing it to all reference translations that we have. That sounds a little bit like, okay, uh, maybe something is right here and a little bit is right there, but then what does this tell us about this thing here? When this was introduced early in the 2000s, I think the original paper is from 2001, um, people the, the people who introduced this from IBM, they ran a number of experiments showing that when the blur score goes up, the human rating also goes up. And that's the basic insight here. The blur score, if the blur score goes, gets better, then also the human rating needs to go, needs to improve. If that is not given, if, you're, if you doubt this, and if you run your own experiments and you come up with different conclusions, then you have very interesting results. 
So, in most cases, if the blur score improves, the human ratings also improve. That's the basic uh, understanding. Now, let's look at a concrete example. Let's assume we have a machine translation system which translates from Chinese to English. And for a given Chinese sentence, it has produced two machine, tra we have two machine translation systems and they produce these two sentences. The first one is, it is a guide to action which ensures that the military always abides the commands of the party. The second machine translation said, it is to ensure the troops forever hearing the activity guidebook that party direct. And e already now our stomach tells us uh, the first one is better than the second one, right? Okay. Um, and now how does Bleu come to the same conclusion? Well, we have three reference translations. So these three translations have been done by human translators. I'll let you read them for a second. Okay, three human translations. Now, our task is to find out how big is the overlap between machine translation output one and these three candidates, these three references, and how big is the overlap between candidate number two and these three references. And here we go through this uh, step by step. First thing we want to compute is called unigram precision. That means how many single words in our machine translation occur in any of these reference translations. Now, the word it, does it occur in any of the reference translations? Yes, is yes, a, yes, guide, yes, and so on and so forth. And it turns out the only word that does not occur in any of the reference translations is the word obeys. So our conclusion is 17 out of these 18 words occur in any of the reference translations. Okay. Now let's look at the second, and I'm coming back to this remark up there in a, in a moment. Uh, let's look at the second machine translation output. Which of these words occurs in any of the reference translations? Well, all the ones that are marked with a, a 1 or a 4 here, uh, the word the occurs 4 times, um, that occurs twice, and so on. Uh, so, of all these words in our sentence, uh, ensure troops, activity, hearing, and direct, and guidebook, none of those occurs in any of the reference translations. So the answer is only 8 out of 14 words occur in any of the reference translations. So the first machine translation is a lot better than the second one. Now, you could argue, well, how about word order? they can occur in any random order in the reference translations uh, or the, the machine translation can be in any random order uh, and then it would still lead to 8 out of 14 well that's why we're looking at word sequences now so the blur score includes also bigram precision and now we're looking at all word sequences of length 2 it is is a, a guide, guide to, to action, and check how often do they occur in any of the reference translations. Again, you see with the numbers here, this occurs, that occurs, but which assures that does not occur. Action which does not occur. So out of the biograms, out of the 17 biograms that we have, 10 occur in the reference translations, and 7 are missing. And here, 
the answer is one out of the 13 bigrams it occurs. Only the it is any everything else does not occur in the reference translations. Then we move on to word triples. I don't have a slide for this, but it's exactly the same story. For all triples that we have, word sequences of length 3, we're checking how many of them occur in the reference translations. And then we're getting an even better measure for word sequences, for word order. The longer the sequences, the more you're modeling the word order in the reference translations. And we go to the lengths of 4, and then we stop for practical reasons. And then the values that we're getting for unigram precision, bigram precision, trigram precision, quadruple precision, they are all combined, and then there's a magic something, computation, in order to compute the crystal. That's the reason. That's the way the crystal is computed. <coughs> Now, let's go one step back, and what, uh, what do we have here? Um, Bleu is a precision measure, which means it only checks how many of the words actually occur in here. So if you have as uh, the machine translation output only the word it Let's, let's assume that the machine translation output would only consist of this word. Then the precision would actually tell us, well, one of one, 100% of the words are in the reference translation. Great, you have produced a perfect translation. Right? Precision tells us this is perfect. The word that we produced is in the reference translation. So we need to account for the length of the sentence. So there is a so-called brevity penalty, meaning if the machine translation output is shorter than the shortest reference translation, then it's bad. So we're subtracting something from the score. The other thing is, let's assume this word it occurred 17 times. Then again we would say, wow, wonderful. It is in the reference translation. It is as long as the reference translation. Great, perfect. And therefore, there is one more constraint telling us every word in the machine translation output can only be used as many times as it occurs maximally in any of the reference translations. That means, for example, the word the can be used maximally four times because in one of them here it occurs four times. Let's see, I think it's this one here. The, 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 the occurs four times. So a maximum of four thes are actually accepted in the machine translation. And if there's more, you're not counting them anymore. So we're using Summing up, we're using unicram, bigram, trigram, quadruple precision plus a brevity penalty. If it's too short, we are subtracting and we are only using as many times as it occurs in any of the reference translations. All this taken together gives you the blue score. Now, what is a good blur score? When is a blur score so good that it can be used for post-editing? When is it so good that it can be used for publishing without any changes? Um, only experience tells us, and now I'm, I'm only writing this very briefly on the board, because if you're quoting me here, uh, many other people will say, I mean, this is, uh, this is really uh, risky to say this. I claim if the blur score is greater than 30, then, this is blur here, 
you can use it in productively for posting. So if you have a machine translation system and you're running it on your text, you're getting a blur score of 31, 32, you can be sure that post-editing saves you time compared to translating from scratch. If it is larger than 50, then you can, it still has errors, but then you can publish it. It's a very rough estimation and a lot of people will not like that, but I think it's a good indication of where we are. Anything that is below 20 is more or less useless. So as soon as you're going above 20, you can start thinking of using it. Above 30, that's good for post editing. Above 50, only minor problems. So in these I, I um, introduced to you the machine translations that machine translation systems that we built for the Scandinavian languages and subtitling, from going from Swedish to Danish and from Swedish to Norwegian. Those were uh, above 50 in terms of blue score, because languages were so close. We had lots of training material and um, very in-domain, very very good material. Uh, so there were about 50. We still corrected them because in TV you cannot publish anything that has any errors, uh, but they're very high quality. Um, other than that, uh, I guess this gives you an indication of reverse. And I'm happy to discuss it with you and with your experiences. If you say 25 is good for post editing, I'll be happy with this. I just want to give you rough numbers that if you see blur scores, tells you something. Nobody wants to argue against this. A tank is away here, so nobody sees this, uh, but you have an indication of what, what blows goes. I promise I'll check, because we get the records every six months from every And I just need to find the report to see the numbers. I think with the kind of training material that you have, I would assume that you're above 40 for a language pair like uh, English, Spanish, or so the good language pairs will be on, on the 40s, I would guess. Yeah, okay, that makes perfect sense. Perfect. The system that I trained on Let's MT for German English, the ones where we looked at the uh, result table before, uh, had a blur score of 20, and uh, that corresponds to my impression. None of the sentences that I entered was uh, correctly translated, so it was pretty bad. Questions? We covered all five points here, so uh, I'm happy that. Uh, Came to, uh, to the end. Since we still have a minute, uh, may I ask the groups, uh, how is your work progressing? Have all groups managed to meet yet? Helene? <laughs> 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 the Czech group? We're living so, uh, together. Yeah, so we're living together, so you're meeting all the time. Yeah. Have you started collecting texts, doing things? Uh,
professors here that if you have any questions or problems or you find that you need some additional advice on the tools to use or the methodology and so on that you can absolutely approach us via email, right? Yeah. Right, absolutely, or over here or wherever. Wherever, yeah. yeah. Okay. I have a question. Uh, sure. So the, the absolute number in the blue score is a hundred. Uh, the the maximum number is a hundred. Yes. So if you if you uh, compute exactly the same as a human reference translation. Yes. Uh, one thing I should of course mention is that uh, this case here, where we have three reference translations, is the ideal case. Or close to the deal, it would be even better to have 10 reference translations. Um, and uh, the case which we usually have is that we have one reference translation. So we have one human translation. And one thing that uh, is important, yeah, very important point here is, if you have multiple reference translations, that means automatically your blur scores go up. Yeah? So the numbers that I just showed you here are blue scores against one reference translation. So it's very intuitive. If you have three options to compare against, it's much more likely that any of these words in your machine translation pops up somewhere. Whereas if you only have one reference translation, as is usually the case in Europal and so on, uh, then you're comparing only your machine translation against this one reference translation. So one of my students, uh, when I asked, uh, well, how can you improve your machine translation system, well, I said, well, take more reference translations, <laughs> because then your blur score goes up. Uh, don't fall into this trap. Mm -hmm. That changes nothing on your machine translation system if you use multiple reference translations. Still the same machine translation, but it looks better. Yeah. So whenever you see a blur score listed anywhere, make sure you understand against how many reference translations has been computed. In 99% of the cases, it will be one reference translation. But if people have multiple reference translations, their systems look better. And uh, just be careful about this. Yeah, but couldn't there be some problem with, uh, for example, style? If it's if it's uh, just if it's free here, uh, the translation uh, doesn't necessarily to be bad, but if it's just differently translated, it would look like it's bad. Exactly, and that's why I mentioned maybe yesterday or the day before that if you compute a blur score for one single sentence, exactly this can happen. You might have a perfect machine translation, but it's just different from the reference translation. That's why you're computing this for a thousand sentences or five thousand sentences, and then it should equal out. Yeah. Yeah. So in some sentences you might actually score very badly, in some sentences you score very high, um, especially if these five thousand sentences come from different translators, your chances of getting a, a score that represents the quality of the machine translation system is fine. Uh, that's that's a basic understanding, but your argument is absolutely valid. You know? so don't uh, believe in, in only doing the score on, on five sentences. Uh, you need to do it on, on a larger number of sentences, and I would say a thousand is probably the lower bound. Just a, um, a question. Uh, I, I thought about like um, he, he talked about style. Um, nowadays in academia, you have uh, you have like copyrighted uh, copyright. They they uh, try to get get the uh, style if somebody copied the, just copied the text. And is blue on, could blue also be used in this kind of way? To, like to find out if somebody copied a document. I mean, I mean if you. For example, you write a thesis and there was already someone who did the work and you just copied his... So plagiarism detection, basically yes. So uh -huh. it's, it just measures text similarity and you can use it also to measure text similarity between one English text that you have produced 
and a thousand other English texts and you can find out if your sentences or similar versions of your sentences occur somewhere else. The other thing that I'm always uh, wondering about is if we're, we're talking about uh, applications to the right and to the left. If you're an English teacher and uh, you have uh, given your students an assignment to write a, um, um, uh, you say, uh, an, an exam uh, and you know the perfect solution to this. Now your students submitting uh, 25 different um, uh, exams now, can you automatically grade them based on blue? Because the closer they are to the perfect uh, solution, the better grade they should have. And I mean, this is the dream of all English teachers in the world, yeah? to have an automatic grading system. It could save an infinite amount of time. Uh, I don't want to sell blue to them. Uh, I think it probably not reliable and doesn't take many things into consideration and so on. But this is the kind of thought experiment that you can do. According to this idea, I don't think the students would be happy if they know that they were marked like this. Automatically? Yeah. <laughs> right, but uh, if they get a good... On the other hand, there are no emotions or no personal insights. So exactly. I mean, this is limited to yeah. also, don't want to use this for Harry Potter translations. I only want to use it for technical translations. <laughs> How to choose? Right. Um, as random as you can, and as uh, representative as you can of the type of text that you want to translate afterwards. It's so a short answer. High frequency occurrences. High frequency occurrences. No, I wouldn't do that. Uh, I would, if I would, if if you want to translate uh, in in your application, you want to translate certain things afterwards, like treaties or whatever make sure that the uh, reference translations are actually treaties and then get a better feeling of how good your system is for translating treaties. Um, that is a consideration, but other than that, as random as you can, because you do not know what, what is in your incoming translations later on. So that would be good tools as well. Ready for lunch? Thank you very much for listening. Thank <laughs> you.